parts of God. Where it is. Uh, is this the most current version? Um, hopefully it is. I can check real quick. Yeah, can you do a good poll first? Yeah, I thought I did. Maybe it's not up to date. Uh, it's kind of like FA 16. Or actually, huh? no, no, that's the Docker. Oh, okay. Um, uh, wait. wait, can someone check real quick that if you go into the projects directory, do you have a benchmark folder? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you guys have it. Okay. So yeah. you don't have that benchmark folder. Uh, that's weird. Uh, why is this, is this in the regular one as well? Take a second. That's not bad. Okay. That's a little bad, but um, you should be up. Soon enough. Oh yeah, and uh, while while we uh, do the poll on, on the repository, uh, if you still have questions on like how to submit or uh, how to beat the benchmark or any any other questions regarding this competition. Please come to office hours. Uh, they're there to to uh, answer all your uh, all your questions and to help out uh, when you guys uh, are having trouble. So um, please do so. My office hours are tomorrow and also Wednesday. Uh, I, I I want to talk to you guys. Please. Um, and what are your office hours? Sorry, it's uh, tomorrow from 11 to 1 p.m. and also Wednesday 11 to 1 p.m. Okay. Uh, okay. So we'll get started on the benchmark code. Uh, you guys should see this thing right here. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and talk about uh, what uh, goes inside the script and um, how it's made. So uh, first things first, uh, if you go to the very top, we're importing the packages that we wanted uh, from lecture before, pandas, numpy, uh, matplotlib, uh, stat models for the linear regression model, uh, the train test split for S from sklearn for uh, doing validation, even though we're not going to be using it for the script. Uh, and something called uh, skew, which is a hint, actually, on something special you can do in order to improve your model. Um, okay, so going to uh, how to uh, actually submit onto Kaggle and train your model on the training data. So first, you read in both the train and test sets. Uh, so if you run this cell, uh, oops, run this cell first. Okay, uh, so we have both the train and test sets uh, in, in our notebook. And then uh, what you do immediately is convert the response variable to log of x plus 1. And uh, this was the thing that I mentioned in uh, a previous lecture and what you're supposed to do because of the weird thing that Kaggle did uh, in order to uh, make, the, make the errors not as extreme for large uh, home prices. So uh, this line, mp.log1p, uh, is basically log plus 1 of something. So that, that, uh, that transformation is one line. And then the next thing, next thing I did is I didn't even consider the categorical variables. I only pulled the numerical variable types. And in order to do that, uh, you can like select the columns yourself by doing uh, train uh, train dot d types to see which columns were numeric. Or there is actually a convenient function uh, that Pandas has, uh, select d types, where you can basically tell it that uh, I, I want all the number types of data, uh, in, uh, and to subset the, the data frame. Um, based off those uh, columns. So this is what train numeric is. It contains entirely of numeric data. Um, the same thing for the test set too. So notice that the uh, thing that I'm doing for train, I'm also doing for the test. Uh, minus uh, this little thing over here, which I'll get back to later. Uh, but everything that I'm doing to train, you have to do to the test set uh, in terms of feature engineering, data cleaning, et cetera. 
so that everything matches uh, the model when you're feeding it, uh, feeding data, uh, feeding it data from the test set. So um, going on to filling in missing values, uh, there are a couple missing values inside this data set, so you can't actually run the model without dealing with them. Uh, and again, it's a simple function, fill NA, and I just chose to fill in the mean of every single column uh, to fill in those NA points. Um, and again, for the test set, I did exact, uh, the exact same operation. Um, then I create my train and test set by uh, doing this, like train Y is equal to train numeric sale price, and then train X uh, uh, is train numeric dot drop sale price, axis equal to one, dropping the column. Um, and then the next line is fitting the model, sm dot OLS, oh, sorry, uh, OLS, uh, train Y, train X. So, uh, and then we do CLF dot fit right afterwards. Uh, that is done, and actually I should be running these lines while I'm talking. Cool, so uh, that model is fit, and then uh, to predict, we just do result.predict test x, get our predictions. Um, let me show you guys what it looks like right now. Oops. Uh, wait, what? Oh, there we go. Uh, so it has this array of like 11s, 12s, etc. And in order to convert that value back to the home price value that uh, that is considered normal, we do uh, uh, we exponentiate all the values um, and then uh, subtract one at the very end because we added one from uh, this operation before. So uh, if you run that line, we get our preds back. Uh, let me show you what it looks like. So now we have these uh, bigger values, which is, which is good. Um, after that, if you want to submit to Kaggle, first you want to put everything inside of the data frame, your predictions, as well as the test ID that corresponds to each row. Uh, and so that will, this line uh, will give it a, in this case, this is a dictionary, where the dictionary has uh, a key called ID and a sale price uh, key as well that hosts the predictions. And when it creates a data frame, it will grab all the keys uh, in this case, these strings over here, put them inside the column names, and then the corresponding values like test.id and preds will go inside uh, each column. So when you uh, run this line, you get this data frame where it's exactly the format that Kaggle wants, uh, ID on the left side, and then uh, the predictions or the home prices on, on the right side. Uh, and then finally, if you want to convert this to a CSV, then all you need to do is solution.csv, the file name, uh, Index is equal to fox, uh, false because we don't want um, the like label values on the left hand side. Those are like extra information that we don't need, uh, and this will give you a score of zero point one four two four five. Yeah, it's slightly cut off. But any any questions about that? This is technically like all I really want. Like what I expected you to do uh, to uh, read in the data, fill in the missing values. Uh, like categorical variables are too hard, so I just I will ignore them um, and do do the train and test splits um, to fit the model on, predict, uh, do this one last conversion in the very end, and then submit to Kaggle using these two lines, which I think uh, these are taken from the Kaggle kernel. So if you like look at someone's kernel and go to the very last two lines, uh, you see like these two lines of some form. Uh, and that's like how, they basically tell you how to submit onto Kaggle at that point. So, uh, yeah, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed for the train test split, um, if you mm -hmm. use like a different random state, the uh, the RMSEs were quite different. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's from the validation method, uh, and you'll definitely see that. For some data sets, the, especially large data sets, the scores won't um, uh, fluctuate too much. Uh, since, uh, I don't know how many rows there are, I think it's like, 1000 2000 oh, okay yeah it's it's still not too, it's still not that much uh, so you definitely still see some fluctuations in the in the scores which is why like cb is better because cb uh, scores are uh, generally less variable than the validation test scores um, but in general the uh, whatever cb score that you do get um, it should mirror the public leaderboard in some form it shouldn't be too too large so um, uh, in general, like if you were between like I don't know, uh, like between zero point like zero point, uh, 
what's a good value? 0 0.02 or 0 0.03 around your CV, local CV value, uh, then you're generally like in the range uh, uh, of doing things correctly. Yeah? I think one thing I noticed mm -hmm. that made it difficult is that we could do this script very easily, yeah. but since the uh, description of the project had a million things like try more than one model, try fusion Try this, try that. Oh, okay. We get it ourselves before we were ready to do this. I see. That made us like completely just miss the mark. I see, I see. So uh, I see what you mean. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so yeah, just I guess uh, my intent was for you to learn how to uh, feature engineer and data clean because uh, those are very important skills. Uh, and also interpret the data, like do different models and to try to interpret different ones. Um, in general, uh, though, like that—that's really the core of data science. Not it's not prediction, like getting the highest prediction, which is important on Kaggle. But for anywhere else, uh, doing like proper cleaning and feature engineering, interpreting what you did and telling what other people have, what you've done uh, is actually, I'll argue, even more important. Which is why, like, I want you guys to focus on that. Uh, unfortunately, though, it did bog down on. Uh, on creating, like knowing how to create a simple model uh, afterwards, and then to do a simple script, uh, submit a simple script onto Kaggle, and then slowly build upon it. So I guess, um, I guess, like I tell you this now, that when you're going about doing these projects, uh, do focus on the feature engineering, the cleaning, explain what you did, and interpreting uh, what models you you uh, you ran on top of it. Uh, but at the same time, like after that, try to submit something onto Kaggle. A just a very simple script without any like uh, any like uh, I don't know wrangling at all, uh, and then slowly build upon it uh, according to what you found in uh, your your data data analysis stage. Did you want to comment? Oh, I would say in the opposite order. Yeah, I mean like <coughs> submit some. I know that you might. Oh uh, yeah, that. and they're, they're different submit mindsets. They're different mindsets. Then, yeah, submit something and then try to implement more interesting methods. Not try with the really interesting stuff first, and then end up not being able to submit. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, so, so what Joseph said is like another another path you can do. Uh, pick pick the path that you, like best suits you, um, and like in the end, you'll be doing uh, similar things. So, um, uh, any any questions so far? Because right now, uh, for the people who do not uh, cannot submit at all, or like got really, uh, really high errors on Kaggle. Um, by Wednesday, and this is like uh, this is something that I really, really encourage you guys to do. Go th like read the, read the script again, and then go into Kaggle. Notice that uh, this this error over here is not the benchmark that I gave you guys. It's actually a slightly higher benchmark, uh, and this is because I did something one extra thing to it uh, to get that score. Uh, let me show you where it is. Okay, go to kernels. Uh, where is it? Oh yeah, this guy. By the way, uh, recognize this guy's face because this guy pops up a lot and he does really cool things. So anyways. <laughs> also the goose. Oh yeah, and the goose. <laughs> All right, so uh, this guy, uh, this guy's group, uh, he did regularized linear models, which is a bit more advanced type of linear models. Uh, you're in no, uh, we like we, we do not expect you to know like any of the advanced stuff, but uh, uh, he actually uh, explains a couple of things that he did to the data in order to improve like his score uh, drastically um, uh, beyond like the simple model that he did. Uh, can you get rid of the, the stuff on the right? Oh yeah, cool. All right, so um, if you read his data preprocessing step uh, over here, uh, he tells you like uh, what exactly he did. First, uh, importantly, he transformed the, the numeric features um, that were skewed. So if you uh, look, so, so this is like trying to pick out uh, 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 like hidden techniques that other people have mentioned in their code or inside the forms or in their notebooks that could potentially help you when you're like improving your prediction score. So uh, basically, this is something like, even if you don't understand what this means, like try to copy it. And he shows you exactly how to copy it um, over here. So log transfer the target, he did that, et cetera. Uh, and then log transform the skewed numeric features by running uh, these, lines of codes of, uh, these lines of code over here. And if you want to really understand why uh, this code works or what the skewedness means, um, then you can do other two things. One, go onto Wikipedia. Uh, skew, uh, 
and then just add the label statistics. And then it talks about gen generally what skewness means, and like it gives you re like really nice graphs, like negative skew, positive skew, uh, etc. So when you're looking at a column uh, and plotting it, uh, you typically like see these kinds of behaviors. It turns out for linear regression, uh, it doesn't do too well if the data is skewed like this. Uh, and this goes back to the uh, idea of outliers. Because if you have large outliers in your model, uh, for linear regression at least, uh, it will throw the linear regression off. Uh, like say if you have one point, like I don't know, in the tens of millions of home prices, for example, uh, it will try to fit that point as closely as possible. Um, but if you, if, it, if you let it do that, then the model will actually shift way too far away from what is considered normal. So uh, this is basically the, the idea of, of transforming this skewness into something that's more normal looking uh, by taking the log. And if you go inside the comments too, uh, it talks about this a lot. Uh, uh, where is it? Uh, oh yeah, so if you go inside the comments, there will be people like asking questions about why this person did what he did. Like, would you explain in data preprocessing why do you need to use log and, uh, and skew? And then he answers below. I log transfer certain features for which skew was better, et cetera. This, was make, this will make the feature more normally distributed, and this makes linear regression perform better, since linear regression is sensitive to outliers. So uh, please, please read, read like, what other people have talked about if you don't, like, don't understand something. Generally, like, the CAG community is really, really responsive and helpful. Uh, and uh, you will learn a lot more if you like, take the time to really cherry pick some ideas, uh, ask about it if no one, has, no one else has asked before. Um, and then these guys will, will most likely respond back to you on exactly why they did um, what they did. So uh, if, you, uh, if you also look at this notebook, there's like a bunch of other stuff too. Um, but like, try not to get bogged down on the things you don't know. Um, but just focus on the things that you can try like right now um, that are simple to do. Like uh, first transform the features, create dummy variables with the categorical features, uh, replace the numeric missing values with the mean of their respective columns. Uh, these are things that are already outlined for you. Uh, you just need to go and find it. So, um, yeah, so for people, again, for people who cannot submit anything, uh, check out the script. And then for the people who cannot uh, beat this type of, type of benchmark, uh, again, check out the script. And then if you really want to uh, try to beat the 0 0.135 that I have for you, uh, I'm going giving you a very, very direct hint in that you should probably look at this line and do something about it. So, um, uh, yeah, and also if you want even more direct hint, you should look at this code and copy it. <laughs> All right, so, um, no, well, it's, some things will like uh, change a little bit, but it's basically exactly what it is. So, anyways, um, any questions? Yeah. Following copying, if we ever look into some repository like and find a different group of code that we want to incorporate, we have to, you know, Yes, if the majority of your, like, if your, most of your notebook is actually their notebook, please cite. Uh, it's, it's always a good idea yeah, to cite. How do you have to decide? Is there some you want to Oh, yeah. So, like, at the very top, like, you've just mentioned, like, uh, par like, part of this notebook was from this person's notebook. Like, mention this guy's name. Uh, uh, maybe include a link, to to the kernel as well. That, th those were, th those were, will always be good, uh, uh, good habits to do. Um, but if you like, uh, I don't know, just read uh, like something and see something interesting, like with just one particular idea, you don't need to cite like the, the, all the twenty or thirty people that you borrowed from. Uh, it's mostly when you like actually copy uh, copy stuff, like exact code, then you should probably start um, citing things and giving credit where it's due. Yeah, for this, uh, sure, why not? To be safe. Uh, <laughs> But like anything less than this, like don't worry about it. Oh, okay. So yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. So that is question for a categorical variable. Mm -hmm. like, um, one option like you showed us was include dummy variables, but like that's some of the other ones that are also kind of like putting them as like five for increasing or like kind of ranking them because they were like how good like I thought they were doing. Oh. Which variable was this? Do you remember? Um, 
Yeah, that is uh, that is entirely valid, and it's something that uh, I forgot to mention as well. Uh, you can definitely do that, uh, and it is one way of dealing uh, categorical variables. If there is some kind of ranking in, uh, inherent to the variable, like uh, uh, worse, uh, sorry, uh, bad, like horrible, bad, uh, good, best, or something like that, then turning those into a ranking numeric feature, like zero, one, two, three, four, uh, is definitely a uh, a, a good approach. Uh, sometimes, and in fact, it will give you more information than uh, simply uh, doing dummy variables. So, um, yeah, that, that's definitely one one technique that uh, you, you found, which was a valid technique. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. Oh yeah, this is arbitrary. Yeah. Um, in fact. Uh, another hint, direct hint, um, once you copy this, uh, you can change this value and improve the score even more. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, again, like, if you have any questions whatsoever, like, please come to office hours and I can, like, like walk you through this uh, myself. And if, uh, uh, if our office hours are inconvenient, please email us, we can try to schedule Oh, yeah, that's true, too. Um, those office hours are just official ones, and then, like, out, uh, outside that time, definitely we'll have some time outside as well. So, yeah. Uh, there's the uh, there's the one statistic you can get from the stats models, um, API thing. Do you remember uh, when we ran the linear regression with using um, stats models dot API? Uh, yeah, dot API, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you can yeah you can get like the what what's the function called that you can get all the correlation between all the variables. Uh oh, that's not from that's not from the SAS package. That's just built in. It's dot core c o r r. Okay, yeah. So you use dot core to basically get an idea of what the correlated variables are, and so. Uh, well, in a very in a very like basic sense, if you're talking about a single like categorical variable, you could just group your table by it and then just look at what the averages are to get some sense of like what different values produce different things. But, yeah. So, so you're, basically, I mean, you're basically saying like basically go I go through the table and only grab the elements that have this specific. I mean, like literally like dot group, and then you see like what the different values point to to get an idea of how they might be compared to each other. Yeah, so that's like yeah. There's a lot of different things, things you can do to figure that out. Uh, and also, I'll just add one more thing. Uh, dot core. If you select first only the column that particular column you want to do a correlation on, and then do dot core, and then as a parameter put in another column. Then it just run one correlation between that variable and another and the column it'll, that you it'll want. It will spit out a number that basically just says like how correlated these two values are. Yeah. So you could maybe do the same thing with the um, basically the the category the uh, well, like the house prices in this case, I believe, like order stuff. So is it a good idea to then remove like some percentage of the non correlated variables? Uh, the you mean you mean the highest correlated? No, no you want to remove them from. No, I think lowest correlated. If it's, if, it's, if it's high correlation, uh, generally you want oh, to. Maybe we have, we're, we're confusing something here. Uh, if you, there's another function that you should probably use. Go look back at the the, um, the lecture on linear regression, specifically the code on the lecture. And uh, there's one function where you, you can call and you'll get the p values of, the, of each um, individual variable. In summary, summary, right? Summary? Yeah, yeah, yeah so I think if you, when you call summary, you can see the p values of each one. And it'll it, a lower p value means it's probably going to be like an indicative of uh, like um, of a useful variable basically. The, I, I, my mistake on the correlation part. The correlation part is really good for detecting which variables are like dependent on each other, and you typically want to remove those uh, variables which have high correlation with another variable in there because you don't want to repeat the same information. It'll like it'll tr affirm uh, basically a value which you don't which is incorrect. Uh, talk to us after class if you have more questions. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, like, in general, like, if you don't know, like, whether you should be doing something, that's where validation method comes in, cross-validation method comes in. If you, like, take out a, a column and you don't know if exactly if that's the right thing to do, uh, check your CV score. If it went down uh, in terms of accuracy, then that's bad. If it went up, then that's good. So this is something that you continuously just do, like, every single time. You change something minor and then see how, if that improved or not. If that did not improve, then, then uh, 
then taking it out uh, or putting it in did not, ma did not matter in the first place. All right, I think we gotta move on. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, so. Do you push to the regular? I pushed for a public one. I'm having some weird issues with public one. Okay, I don't even think I have class 16. Like, uh, so I don't think I cloned uh, it, so I don't want to deal with that. Wait, uh, why don't we just clone wait, it real quick? Uh, do, do you guys have, like, day uh, day eight inside the code folder, by chance? No? Uh, if you get full, would you have, would you have it, though? Uh, they don't have that. Wait, wait, you said you don't you don't have it in your... I, I, I haven't cloned Kaggle underscore file 16. What, what did you push to, then? The public one. Wait, hold on. Oh, the public one is FOSS 16. Oh, well, so maybe we're good. We're probably good on our part then. Wait, the public one's FOSS 16? Mm -hmm. Oh, my computer dies. Um, okay, no, wait, 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 wait. Can I see? So wait, do we have a day eight here? But not, not in like slides or anything, but in um. Let's see. Okay, hold on. Code. Okay. Day eight. Is this the public one? No, this is the private one. Oh, then I only have the private one. Okay, cool, so cool. Yeah, we... the FOSS 16 is the... Uh... Okay, so... <laughs> well, we'll get to um, it in a second. I think we can yeah. just... Well, Jerry, no, let's do this real uh, Well, yeah, they don't need... Jer Jerry, can you copy down the, the the thing and move it to the public one? Uh, Sorry, I was... it. It's just in uh, code day 8. Yeah. Um. Okay, that looks nice. Uh, let's just check to make sure this is still running. Yeah. Wait, yeah, or...? Uh, I can't connect to the internet at the moment. You can't connect to the internet at the moment. I just started oh, my computer, so. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll push it in a second. We'll announce it when, when it's up there. Yeah. But for now, you can just watch the... Uh, yeah, the I don't screen. think that... Actually, this is good, because there's really not that much that you would want to run anyway. Okay, so... All right, so I know that we're all still having some... We're... we're Still, uh, n perhaps not quite emotionally done with housing prices, but we're going to introduce uh, another data set now. This also is currently being run in a public Kaggle competition. Let me actually show that to you. So, I'm going to be introducing the... Aha, here we are, yes. Yes, going to be introducing the MNIST digit recognition data set. And let me give you an idea of what that looks like. So, import some things. It's not what I wanted to see. That's because you don't have the, cut, the, the stuff. Uh, I mean, it's in a different directory. Yeah. Huh? Uh, it's called digit recognizer? Yeah. Oh, okay. um, oh. one more dot dot. Excellent. All right. And I have some, yeah, basically I'll give you an idea of what it looks like. Okay. So basically what this data set consists of is uh, 40, uh, basically I think like 50,000 training and 20,000 test examples of handwritten digits. Um, half of which were written by U.S. Census Bureau employees and half of which were written by middle schoolers. So there is some variance in like how good the digits look. Uh, so this is actually just the first five examples. So I made a little um, utility function that you might want to take a look at that um, just takes the vector of uh, about length 800 pixels, uh, vector of length 800, transforms it into a matrix and displays it to you. So this is an example of what your computer is seeing when you look at the digits. So each of these is represented as just a vector of values, each of which goes from 0 to 256. So they're all in grayscale. Here they're in blue to red scale, but there's no RGB. It's just how strong each pixel is. Um, actually, really quickly, give you an example of what a vector looks like. So the actual data itself looks something like Yeah, basically the data itself just looks like a vector with a whole bunch of zeros where there was nothing written and then a couple of actual values where uh, there actually was some pencil mark. And what we end up getting is these representations like this. Uh, so actually one thing I want to show you is we can group the data by its label from 0 to 9. 
and we can get the actual averages of the images. So basically what you're seeing here is every single zero in the data set laid on top of one another, this is sort of the average of all zeros. If you look at the average of all ones, you see some of them were straight up and down, some of them were slanted somewhat to the right, and so what we end up getting is not, not obviously a one. And for each data set, we can see these sort of average images for every label in the 10 labels 0 to 9. So basically, the competition is just you get tens of thousands of these uh, linked 784 vectors, each of which represents an image, and you want to predict some other 10,000 or so more of them. And so, really quickly, this will take a bit of time to run. Uh, that will take a bit of time to run. This will take a bit of time to run. I have to import time. It'll take so long. Um, oh, you haven't pulled since I pushed some other stuff. That's all right. Okay, so really quickly, so one first thought, a model we've already discussed for classifying stuff like this um, is logistic regression. So we have the concept where we have, basically we have labels and values, and the labels are categorical, right? You're never going to have a digit that's 1.5, so you wouldn't want to use a, you wouldn't want to estimate a value, you'd want to uh, choose the most probable category. So one possible example, or one possible algorithm we could use for this prediction is logistic regression, which running on a pretty small subset of the data took about 40 seconds, and it got an 80% accuracy rate over uh, like 10,000 digits it's trying to predict. Um, so I'm going to introduce today a new model that on this data, on predicting what, you know, predicting more of these vectors based on other vectors, on other hand-drawn images, gets about 95% accuracy. And uh, if we actually look at the MNIST website, I really encourage you guys to all check this out. There is a huge set of uh, past research papers achieving all sorts, of, using all sorts of different methods and getting all sorts of different accuracies, pretty much all of them higher than the accuracy I'm going to demonstrate today. But they all use some really interesting uh, techniques are that I encourage you to check those out. Percentage error rates? Yeah, those are error rates. So those are like 0.4 percent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with, with convolutional nets, you can get like 0.2 percent on this. I mean, it's a pretty much a solved problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <definitely>. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, okay, but today I'm going to be introducing the k nearest neighbors classifier, which I think is a really Intuitive, uh, intuitive model to understand. Actually, I saw a great graphic that I want to pull up right now. So I'll start with this. Okay, so let's shrink down from our example with 784 dimensions and 10 different classes and uh, go down to an example with only two classes in two dimensions. So basically, we're trying to classify data points as either these red triangles or these blue squares based upon their location in two-dimensional space. And the k nearest neighbor classifier idea is very simple, but this image is nice because it shows how it can be dependent on, well, a factor, k specifically. So basically, the idea of k nearest neighbors is Effort, we take our training data and we just remember the values of all the training data points. And then for every point of uh, testing data, when we're trying to figure out what the label of our testing data is, we find its location in our space. So we're trying to figure out what type of, sha what type of shape this new testing data point is, this green circle. And then we check against its near, uh, the nearest other data points. And you can use a number of different definitions of nearness. In this case, we're just using uh, just Euclidean distance. And that's what I'll be using for today's demonstration as well. So one interesting thing to note with this graphic right here is what would the circle be classified as if we were using one nearest neighbor? It'd be classified as a red triangle. What would the circle be classified as if we were using three nearest neighbors? Still a red triangle. But if we switch to using its five nearest neighbors, now suddenly 
the group consensus is going to be to classify it as a blue square. So basically the idea is we just look at all of the n closest data points and we choose whatever the most common category is from that set. Like the choice of distance metric, there are other ways to do this, but very simple example here, we just say closest Euclidean and most common type in the nearest neighbors of the data point. Hey, Joseph. Joseph. Uh, so if you do get pulled right now, you should get all the files that uh, Joseph All right. Cool. So clearly, we can see that the choice of k in k nearest neighbors is going to make a big difference because right here it would have just flipped the class, uh, changing it from 3 to 5. And next week I'll be giving a talk on choosing parameters such as k. For now, I just want to give a quick demonstration of k nearest neighbors performance on the MNIST data set. But before I do that, actually, I think actually, yeah, I will quickly go on onto this. So, in a slightly more complex example, well not really more complex, we still have only two dimensions, we still have only two data points, we can see one important difference between low k and high k. Um, if we choose k equals 1, what we're basically seeing is that basically if you have a new test point, what class will it be put into based upon the location. And we can see with k equals 1 that we get a very jagged boundary between our classes where um, because there's just one blue dot hanging out right over here, suddenly if something falls into this area where most of the nearby things are orange dots, it's going to be classified as blue just because its nearest neighbor happens to be blue. When we switch to 15 nearest neighbors, we get more um, uh, improperly classified training points. Note that with one nearest neighbor, we won't get training points improperly classified because their closest point is always themselves. But when we switch to 15 nearest neighbors, you can see there's a couple of blue training points that would have been classified as orange and orange training points that would have been classified as blue. But overall, our boundary between blue and orange tends to make a lot more sense. Uh, that, I think in a real world example, you would be more likely to say that the left boundary is the true difference between blue and orange classes than the right boundary. All right, so I'm just going to give a quick show of running k nearest neighbors just using the built-in implementation from scikit-learn and its performance on this data set. So import it and run it and run it. So one thing to note with the k nearest neighbors algorithm is that it tends to, actually I'm not sure, Phil and Jerry, you were mentioned. I mean, it, can it, in my experience, tends to be pretty slow. I don't know, Jerry. Were you surprised by the half hour of training time? Uh, can I think the default implementation is slow. There. Uh, well, wait, actually, uh, think about it this way: you're, you're basically calculating a distance vector for like every single mm -hmm. point. Right? Exactly. Like, that's going to be. That's going to be in this case like 780. There's ten. There's hundreds of millions of distance vectors in this case. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean that that that's exactly why it takes a long time. Yeah. Basically, let's say we have fifty thousand training points and ten thousand test points. So for every test point, we're going to want to find, uh, in this case, the five closest neighbors. Which means for every test point, we have to go through all the training points and check how close it is to each one. So that means that we have to check the closeness of a vector to fifty thousand other vectors. 10,000 times. So you have to calculate closeness 500 million times for this particular uh, for this particular data set, which takes a while, especially when closeness is defined as having 800 different dimensions. Um, so that all being said, I think with this tiny example where we're only using 1,000 points of training data, that should take a couple seconds to train. It's going to blow logistic regression out of the water, though. 87.24% uh, accuracy. And I'm going to launch this right now. Um, this is going to train using the 90% uh, of the training data, and it's going to use 10% uh, of the training data as validation. And it should get about 95% accuracy on that. Um, so yeah, I really didn't plan to go deep into K-nearest neighbors and talk that much about how we're going to choose, um, how we choose K and other stuff. That I was going to leave, I think, towards next week's lecture. I think for now, 
If anyone is at all confused on sort of the format of MNIST, it would be a good thing to make sure you kind of understand what's happening here. Um, one thing to note is this data set can still be like engineered in interesting ways. I've seen a lot of algorithms that perform well on MNIST classification have involved adding features such as is there ever a closed loop formed, which would obviously, you know, hint at the uh, drawn digit being more likely to be a 6 or a 9 or a 0 than to be a 1 or a 4. So there's definitely some feature engineering you can do. You can also note that um, the edges of each of these blocks don't really carry that much information, and you might want to cut those off if you want your models to train faster. Um, there's been some really interesting work in terms of generating new digits by stretching other ones. So there's still a lot of feature engineering you can do here in addition to just running different models. What do you mean by stretching? I can tell you about that after class. Sorry. Let's see. Yeah. What's up? Um, um, yeah, what's a good way to figure out how many, like, how many digits are in a different yeah. Okay. Actually, I didn't plan to cover that today because I thought that I'd run out of time. But I can. Yeah, I mentioned that. Um, Jerry, what do you think about bias variants? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about okay. It. I mean, yeah. The basic I mean, idea is the, the, that you have like yeah. a curve and you can figure out the optimal point. But yeah. Like, we'll, we'll dive into the details of that. The reasons. Of, yeah. We'll talk later about the reasons behind why some k's are better than others. But I mean, the basics of finding the best k can be summarized as try a bunch and see which one's the best. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's the reason we have, uh, that's the reason we use validation data instead of just immediately running on test data, because we want to take some of our training data, try it with a certain K, see how we perform on validation data, and repeat that until we think we found the K that best uh, classifies stuff. I think this might be done by now. Uh, wrong cell. No, definitely not done yet. Um, yeah, I mean, it took me six minutes, and looking at how much faster Phil's laptop was on this, it probably took like four minutes on this. Okay, does anyone else have questions about the data set or about k nearest neighbors algorithm? Seriously, I really, we, oh, what's up? So what exactly are the, the points that you're finding the k nearest neighbors for? Yeah, sure, okay, so... I think for, so it's really easy to visualize k nearest neighbors in two dimensions. You're like, oh, here's the boundary we draw. I mean, basically what we're saying by nearest neighbors here is instead of a two-dimensional space, we have 784 dimensions where each dimension is um, how, much, how bright that pixel was out of the whole image. And we're still using a Euclidean metric where basically we just take one value, subtract it from the other one, square that, sum all 784 squares, and then take the square root. And so basically, the closest images to each other are the ones that um, have the smallest values of that. Actually, you know what? That's a good thing to visualize. So I think I'll pull that up really quick. Basically, like, one step of the two neighbors. I was going to show, like, given a data point, what are the nearest neighbors? Okay. There's a... Um, there's a nice implementation of that with sklearn if I pull it up really quick. You could also do like np.arg or something Yeah, but then I have to write the function. <laughs> and I think that there is right here a, um, yeah, k find the k neighbors of a point. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just do, ah, 96.45% validation accuracy after four minutes. Very nice. Query and features. I think if I do x train, I have to check this oh, really uh, quick. You do, um... How do I? It's like I dot iloc. Yeah, that'll give me that. And what else does it want as input? Ah, uh, yeah, it doesn't want anything. Let's see what that does. It yells at me a bit, but it seems to... Oh, wow, that doesn't look right at all. Hmm. Passing 1D array is deprecated. Ah, 
All right, except I don't even know how to interpret these because I thought it would actually give me the values of the vectors. Query points or points, number of neighbors to get. Oh, it gives you the distance to them? That is, oh, indices of and distances too. All right, cool. That is what I wanted. That looks like distance is two. What about one? Huh. I have no idea what that means. It's saying, because those are definitely not the indices of, oh, oh, I see. Those are, those are the nearest neighbors. Cool. All right. So, yes, let's visualize those. Let me grab my visualization code. So basically, you just found all of the nearest neighbors of the uh, first 10 indices of the training set. Yeah, right? so yeah, I'm just going to pull up the first one to get an idea of that. Blah, 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 down here. Oh wait, yeah. You know what? Actually, yes. What I should do is this. Um, I'll show the first vector, and then I'll do for i in k n index zero one index one through. Show the vector. That should work. Um, what's grouped again? Huh? What's grouped? Oh. Yes, that's not what I wanted. Thank you for noting that. What I want is X train. Okay, should be good. Except it'll yell at me about something else. This is really. Uh, oh, oh, put the, like, the thing on the side, and it'll, um, it'll yeah. open up the network. Yeah, that thing. Oh. Yeah, so it's a little bit less like, tricky. Still, oh, it opens. Oh, yes, that's good. Oh, buffer has wrong number of dimensions. Well, that's a six. Now the only question is what's in it. Oh, oh, you're passing in the you're passing in an array to the um, to get vector from. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. So given the first vector in X train, which turns out to represent a six, we can find its nearest neighbors, which are. Sixes that look extremely similar seems to be really the biggest difference in these is that some of them don't have a very obvious uh, central circle. But yeah. Um, and if I do that for literally anything else, it'll just be the next vector is an eight, and we can see its nearest neighbors are a bunch of other eights. Um, so yeah, basically the nearest neighbors algorithm is pretty good at finding stuff um, that's pretty good at finding the right things. That's why we're getting a 96.45% accuracy rate. So if I did this 20 times, eventually I'd come up with some vector uh, that wouldn't be correct. Any wonder. Eight. Wow, that's pretty good actually that it still manages to get that. Um, no, wait, no, it doesn't still manage to get that. Yeah, there we go. Now they all look like each other. So yeah, and you see if our initial vector is a differently shaped date, then the nearest neighbors are still eights, but they're also differently shaped dates. I think that if we actually look at the most common uh, errors that this thing's making, which I would plan to do next week, a lot of the time it misclassifies eights that look like this one, where they're very tightly bunched together as being horizontal ones, misclassifies a lot of fours as nines. So there's interesting stuff you can do there to see what the most common errors are and ways to fix them. But I'm going to leave that till next week. Um, so yeah, on Wednesday, Phil is going to be talking about a completely different algorithm, despite the fact that it sounds similar, uh, k-means, which has no relation to knn. Oh, but it's uh, close enough that both of us got confused. <laughs> yeah, yes. We both thought we were doing the other person's section. Um, and that is going to be a clustering algorithm where we can look at uh, the most closely related data points in a different way. Instead of trying to classify them, look at clusters of similar data points. But I think I'm just going to wrap up for now. Uh, do you have any questions about the um, simulation?
few steps and everything like that. We can kind of go over that right now. Like, you can have, like, some informal office hours for the rest of the period. And, sure. Um, yeah, otherwise, you're pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I really underestimated how long that would take. For who underestimated? Uh, oh, no, that's right. That's good. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. I'm just going to end the panel if I can and talk about like, choosing A, and that shouldn't take that long. So, um, I'm going to end the panel if I can and talk about like, choosing A, and that shouldn't take that long. So, I'm going to end the panel if I can.